I'm Gordon McIntosh. I teach physics and astronomy at the University of Minnesota Morris. And the courses I've been teaching lately, there's a high altitude ballooning uh, first year seminar. And then I teach a solar system course with a laboratory activity. And then I teach modern physics. So I've been thinking about how to incorporate ballooning into these other courses, specifically the solar system course uh, and the modern physics course. And what I always like to do in solar system especially is take an Earth-based phenomena and show how, if you understand or appreciate what's going on on the Earth, you can see how that translates out into other planets, other bodies in the solar system. So how can we take what we see here, what we're familiar with, and see how it works other places? So that's where this idea came from. And so you can put this into the curriculum development uh, folder. Okay. So a brief outline. Uh, I'll show you a couple of nice pictures of our launch. And then at the end, you'll get a couple of fantastic pictures. So those aren't mine. Uh, but if you don't appreciate the middle stuff, maybe you'll like the, the beginning and the end. We'll talk about the temperature measurement. Simple thing. Most of you do it on all your flights and what you can extract from it and how, what that tells you about the Earth's atmosphere and atmospheric stability. So I put in a pedantic derivation in the middle just to keep the physics people happy. And then we'll talk about solar system bodies and the four solar system bodies with solid surfaces and substantial atmospheres and then a few lab ideas. All right, so here's our first pretty picture. This was our launch. Uh, this was November the 6th of 2010. Uh, November the 6th is the first day of deer season in Minnesota this last year. And so I'm the one at the bottom in the orange sweatshirt. And this is looking to the southwest. Oh, you can see a nice V of geese flying by. And this one's looking to the southeast. So there's sunrise coming up. This was our flight path. Went about 65 miles, uh, hour and a half or two hours. You probably won't recognize any of the towns on that map. They're all a number of very small towns in western Minnesota. Here's the standard uh, Stratosat temperature sensor. This is what we used, the LM335. Uh, it's a very simple device, so I can have solar systems students use it. I can have the high altitude ballooning students use it. If you're more into electronics, it's a very temperature sensor, sensitive Zener diode. And this is uh, the data file that comes back out of the Stratosat satellite, or the satellite command module. The important uh, columns are A3, which is the digitized temperature, and A18, which is the altitude. And then from A3, we can extract uh, the temperature in Kelvin by just doing the simple conversion. So we take the digitized voltage that represents the temperature and get the Kelvin temperature out. And then you've seen some of these today. This is the temperature versus altitude. And this is a little more interesting than some you may have seen today. We did get a temperature inversion. This was before 9 o'clock in the morning uh, on November the, the 6th. And we hadn't had much heating going on before that. So you see the various parts of the atmosphere, lower atmosphere, the troposphere down here. Uh, we have this inversion of the lowest part of the troposphere. And then uh, the temperature decrease as you go up in the troposphere. And that rate of temperature decrease, known as the environmental lapse rate, and I'll be talking about that for a few minutes. And then in the trop uh, tropopause, the lapse rate goes to zero. And then in the stratosphere, the temperature starts to increase again. So those, at least, uh, the temperature decrease, the tropopause, and the temperature increase are typical for most of your flights. The inversion, again, is a little unusual. 
The troposphere is normally heated from the bottom, that is the Earth warms up <clears throat> from sunlight, uh, radiates infrared radiation, and that warms up the atmosphere. Again, on this day, we had this inversion. The Earth had not yet warmed up very much, so the lower atmosphere was still uh, fairly cool. And as you went up, it uh, warmed up instead of cooled down. The measured environmental lapse rate, that's sort of the one over the slope of this line, was 3.2 Kelvin per kilometer. That's the ELR, which is a very low lapse rate. The average, from what I've been able to see in books, is 6.4 Kelvin per kilometer. And we're going to try and acquire more temperature profiles to see, uh, see if that's accurate. And I'd be especially interested in summer profiles to see if we get high lapse rates. So I may be talking to some of you about summer flights. Tropopause, the lapse rate goes to about zero. Temperature's not changing. And then in the stratosphere, the temperature gradient becomes positive, increasing uh, with height. And that's due, as we know, I think people have talked about this, we have the solar ultraviolet radiation that interacts strongly with the ozone, and that heats up the atmosphere, and so that's why the stratosphere warms up, because you have this heating going on in the stratosphere. And we'll see that's a, a relatively unusual phenomenon in the solar system. All right, and then we also extract from this information whether or not the atmosphere is stable. Because the rising air bubbles, if you imagine a little pocket of air, it's going to fluctuate around. If it moves up, it's going to cool down. The temperature will decrease. If that cools faster than the surrounding air, then the bubble will sink back down, and you'll have a nice, stable atmosphere. If the bubble cools more slowly than the surrounding air, then it's going to continue to rise, because it will be at a higher temperature than the surrounding area. It will keep going up. And that's when you'll get convection occurring in the atmosphere. These air bubbles will continue to move upward. And those temperature uh, changes are indicated by these, this idea of the lapse rate. And there are three that I'll talk about a little bit. There's the measured lapse rate, or the environmental lapse rate. And that's our delta T over delta Z temperature change over the altitude change, the absolute value. There's the dry adiabatic lapse rate, which is a really fun one that I've been studying for the last few months. It's about 10 Kelvin per kilometer. And then there's the saturated adiabatic lapse rate, uh, which bottoms out at about 4 Kelvin per kilometer. Depends a little bit on the temperature, because uh, humidity and temperature are related to each other. All right, again, this is where the physics people might be interested if uh, it, <coughs> the derivation of the dry adiabatic lapse rate brings in several nice physics ideas. So that's why I decided to put it into the presentation. You, have the, you start out with the first law of thermodynamics. That is, uh, the amount of heat that goes into the system is either going to change the internal energy or do some work. So. This is the change in the internal energy, n is the number of moles, specific heat at constant volume, change in temperature, and the PDV work. Ideal gas law, PV equals nRT. If you take the derivative of that, VDP plus PDV equals nRT. Nothing too fancy there. And then R, again, the gas constant, is the difference between CP, the specific heat at constant pressure, and CV, the specific heat at constant volume. So there's nice thermodynamics in here. You make the substitutions, and you end up with dQ, the heat input, being the number of moles, specific heat at constant pressure, times cha uh, temperature change minus VDP. Now we go back to the fact that this is the dry adiabatic lapse rate. Well, if it's adiabatic, that means dQ has to be zero. There's no heat exchange with the environment. That means these two things have to equal each other. You make some changes uh, because this is in per mole. And physicists, 
that I know don't like to use moles. We much prefer kilograms. Uh, chemists may like moles, but I prefer kilograms. So here we use the conversion from molecular mass per mole to uh, the molecular mass uh, per kilogram. So you make those changes, and then this capital C sub P then becomes the specific heat at constant pressure per kilogram rather than per mole, and the density in kilograms per cubic, uh, per cubic meter. So that leads you to uh, the change in temperature with pressure is 1 over the specific heat times the density. Now we go through hydrostatic equilibrium. This is the third idea to fold in here. Now we've got the first law of thermodynamics, and you fold in the ideal gas law. Now we fold in uh, hydrostatic equilibrium. It tells us how the pressure changes with height. So you put that in as dp and do your substitutions, and you get that the temperature change with altitude uh, should be minus g, the acceleration due to gravity, and the specific heat at constant pressure. So when you do this, is plug these things in for the Earth. Uh, the acceleration due to gravity is 9.8 meters per second squared. Uh, specific heat for the Earth's atmosphere is about 1,000 joules per kilogram per Kelvin. Plug those in, work the number out, and it's about 10 Kelvin per kilometer. That's the fastest that air can cool down as it goes up. So if the lapse rate is higher than that, which is a very large lapse rate, it's a very steep gradient in temperature, but it's going to convect. It has to, because the air just can't cool down fast enough uh, to not keep moving up. Then there's the saturated adiabatic lapse rate. Now, this, <coughs> this is lower because once you get to saturation, once the air has cooled down enough that it's saturated, then you start condensing the water vapor out into the liquid. It releases the latent heat of condensation, and so the air can't cool down as fast. So it goes down to about 4 Kelvin per kilometer. So this is the stability curves. Over here, Oh, and this is temperature versus height. And down in this range, if the environmental lapse rate, that's the measured delta T over delta Z, is less than about 4 Kelvin per kilometer, the air is going to be stable. If it's between about 4 and about 10, then it's conditional, conditional instability. It may be convecting, it may not. Depends on the details. And if it's more than about 10 Kelvin per kilometer, it's going to be in convection. And that's important because convection is what drives cloud formation. It's going to drive, uh, drive precipitation. It's going to derive, drive weather. So that's what's controlling our weather. And we had, as I say, a very low environmental lapse rate during this launch. So much for thermodynamics. Now we'll go to a little uh, planetary astronomy. There are about or four known bodies in the solar system that have nice solid surfaces and substantial atmospheres. There's the Earth, Venus, Mars, and Titan. And these are the constituents, the major constituents of those atmospheres. The Earth's atmosphere, as you know, is mainly nitrogen, some oxygen. Venus and Mars are mainly carbon dioxide with small amounts of nitrogen. And then Titan, as we've found out in the last five or ten years, is about 90 to 97 percent nitrogen, some argon, and then uh, methane, CH4. If you look at atmospheric pressures at the surface, the Earth is about 1,000 hectopascals, which are the numbers that I've seen in these planetary science articles. So they use units of hectopascals. Venus, 9.2 megapascals. Mars, down to about 6 hectopascals. And Titan is very close to the Earth, about 1,500 hectopascals. We saw, uh, we saw this in an earlier slide. This is just the temperature profile for the Earth. So again, we have the troposphere, where the temperature goes down as you go up, trop uh, tropopause, where it's about zero change as you go up, and the stratosphere as it's warming as you go up. This is Venus. Venus has a much simpler 
temperature profile. I should say this is a theoretical model. I haven't been able to find any data from the Venera spacecraft that, that made it to the surface, whatever it was, 30, 40 years ago. Uh, if I can find that, then I'll replace the slide. But Venus has a very simple temperature profile. Um, you can't read it, perhaps, but the blue one is the night, and the red one is the day. So in the daytime, the top of the atmosphere gets warmed up by sunlight and solar interactions. In the, in the nighttime, it's all cooling down all the way. Not much in the way of a tropopause uh, or a stratosphere. This is one for Mars. Similar sort of thing. It's very simple atmosphere, almost completely carbon dioxide. Once you get high enough, it interacts uh, with solar particles and sunlight and warms up, but there is not much in the way of a, a tropopause or stratospheric warming, as we saw on the Earth. Then on the 14th of January in 2005, the Huygens spacecraft uh, descended to the surface of Titan. Oh, there's also some nice parachute physics that's going on here. Uh, Paul's going to talk about parachutes a little bit tomorrow. This is a parachute in another atmosphere. So we can relate our balloon descents to what's going on uh, studying other bodies in the solar system. This is a temperature profile uh, for Titan. And it's a very interesting temperature profile. Again, you'll see that in the troposphere, we have the same sort of lapse rate. It's warmed by the surface of the body, then it cools down as you go upward. But then you get a, a tropopause for Titan, you get the stratospheric warming, then you get the meso mesopause, I forget, maybe that's a, the uh, stratopause, then the mesospheric cooling, and then it warms up a little bit and gets noisy. The dotted line is the theoretical expectation, the solid line is the measured. Uh, values of temperature versus altitude. So this is the, the data from the Huygens spacecraft. This is the only temperature profile uh, that I could find for these external bodies. Thank you. All right, so you see there's that stratospheric temperature increase in Titan's atmosphere. Just as in the Earth, there's stratospheric warming because ultraviolet interacts with the ozone. Here, there's stratospheric warming because the ultraviolet light from the sun interacts with that methane that's present in the atmosphere. That methane and ozone are not present in Mars and Venus, so they don't get the stratospheric warming. The chemical reactions then of uh, the ultraviolet light with the methane and the nitrogen in the atmosphere produce these compounds known as tholines. Uh, they get polymerized, but they have carbon, nitrogen, and hydrogen in them and they generate the orange color of Titan's atmosphere. So here's one of the fantastic pictures. This is Titan's atmosphere. And it's pretty obvious you can see the orangish color and the bluish at the top, I think it's just light scattering from the thin parts of the atmosphere. And then this is from the surface. You can see the effects of those tholines. They are orange colored and so the atmosphere of the body has an orange color to it. So again, this is a direct comparison of the balloon data that the class took on the 6th of November. Our inversion, uh, tropospheric cooling, stratospheric warming, and Titans over here. Obviously, they're not identical, but there are similarities in the temperatures versus altitude. For Titan, the environmental lapse rate from that last slide is about uh, about 0.83 Kelvin per kilometer down here. Uh, the G is 1.36 meters per second squared. Surface of Titan, specific heat, about 1,044 joules per, per kilogram per Kelvin, close to the Earth's because the atmosphere, again, is mainly nitrogen. So the dry adiabatic lapse rate <clears throat> works out to be about 1.3 Kelvin per kilometer. Uh, I couldn't find a saturated adiabatic lapse rate it's methane saturation, it's not water saturation, so I'll have to talk to a physical chemist uh, to get that information. But we can say it's, we can't say for sure that it's uh, convecting, but there's evidence 
from the other pictures from the surface of Titan that there are uh, lake beds that were probably formed from methane rain falling on the surface of the body and then flowing uh, to methane ponds that may be present or ethane ponds on the surface of the object. So you can take those same convection ideas that generate the Earth's weather, that same convection may be going on at least in areas on Titan's atmosphere um, to generate some sort of weather on Titan. Uh, so I'm going to try to work uh, this fall on generating lab activities. I have a first, uh, first version that's in the conference proceedings. I'll probably uh, modify that considerably before I try it with the class, but after we do the balloon flight, we're going to take that data, they will analyze the temperature profile, we'll take a look at the uh, Titan profile and see how the students can uh, make comparisons then between the Earth and Titan. And Mars and, and Venus being, are not having the same similarities. Uh, these are the references, uh, the Fulgioni, Fulgioni in Nature paper, I pulled a number of those graphs from for Titan, so it's a very interesting uh, paper. Let's see, I should thank James Flatten for all the help that he's been over the years. I should thank University of Minnesota Morris for its support, uh, and I'll try and answer a few questions as time allows. Thank you. <laughs>